Okay, a pleasure to welcome Rachel Sharansky Danziger, part four of our series on Genesis, uh, the basis of human relations. Uh, a pleasure to see everybody, um, and uh, we look forward to learning with you today and uh, throughout the week and uh, continually. And everybody should be well, and we should all be healthy. That's the most important thing. And Rachel, Vakasha. Thank you, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you, everybody who's here. It's really lovely to see you again and uh, to move forward. And the truth is that today we're we're changing gears a little bit. Um, until now, we talked really at length and in depth about particular relationships between particular people. We started with Adam and Chava, and we spent two whole uh, lessons with them. Then last week, we talked about Kain and Hevel at length. Today, at least on the face of it, we're moving to talk about the relationship between God and men in a more general sense. But as we will see, it's a little more complicated than that. And human relationships between different people actually enter the story. But let's start with that. Let's start with the relationship between God and man. One can say that the material we're about to learn today shows us the rock bottom of that relationship. Let's look at it together. And the text doesn't pull any punches. I'm here at the source sheet. I don't know if you have it, but I'm sharing it here. Um, and uh, I'm in box one. The Lord saw how great was man's wickedness on earth and how every plan devised by his mind was nothing but evil all the time. I want to pause here and say that in Hebrew, what God sees is Ra'at ha'adam, the badness, the evilness of man, and the ra, the badness, the evil of his thoughts, both, it's the same word, ra, and it's the opposite. It's a word that stands as a mirror image of a word tov. When God created the world in the beginning in Genesis 1, he kept saying, and he saw that it was good, tov. He made the light and he saw that it was good. He made man and he saw that it was good. And now it's as if the opposite is actually happening. Everything that God declared good is worthless because man, which was the pinnacle of that previous um, story of the story of creation itself, goes to the opposite direction. And this is exactly the conclusion God draws, like I said, rock bottom in Pasuk Vav, verse six. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and his heart was saddened. The Lord said, I will blot out from earth the men whom I created, men together with beasts, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Within four verses, we are faced with the complete collapse of God's relationship with the human race as such, but also at the same time with the rise of a personal relationship, or at least a personal connection where God has favor and has um, uh, love and grace and, and, and liking towards one man, Noah. But in a sense, it's almost as if that last little postscript that he actually liked Noah, that Noah found favor in his eyes, it almost highlights how sweeping God's judgment is regarding the rest of humanity and the world itself. All those different things that God created on the fifth day and on the sixth day, all the different categories of animals are all rejected. Everything is rejected. Man has used up all its chances and humanity as such is now a matter of regret and disgust. Now, this little snippet, this like little expression of sentiment on God's uh, part naturally drew a lot of commentary over many generations uh, for obvious reasons, right? I mean, how can God regret if God is omniscient and omnipotent and God knew what he's creating, right? Um, then how can he suddenly discover that humanity is not what he expected and regret it, right? Also, if um, God regrets all of humanity, what is it about Noah that sets him apart as someone God's like? Is it, is it really reasonable to assume that there is one man amongst all of humanity at the time that found favor 
well, everybody else did not. It just, it's hard to imagine, trying to envision a situation like that. Can, is it, it doesn't usually work this way, right? People are part of a nexus. People are part of a network. If Noah was different from the people around him, presumably other people around him were influenced by him. Or if Noah showed certain qualities, does it mean that other people never showed any qualities? What about his father? What about his grandfather? Where did he come from with these qualities? It wasn't just the generation of his peers that was erased in the Mabu and the deluge. It was his parents, his grandparents, people his children's age, his grandparents' age. How was, uh, how was that supposed to work? Was there really no one there? Also the children, right? All those little children that died in the deluge, what, what they were also so terrible? They didn't have time to sin in such terrible ways, right? There's a lot that is hard to parse and a lot that is hard to understand. And perhaps it's easier or more fruitful instead of trying to really try and answer each of those questions, which at the end of the day, I don't understand God. How am I supposed to answer them, right? Um, it's more fruitful, or at least the approach we will take today, instead of trying to answer each question, why did God decide this? What does it mean that God regret? Take a step back and look at the story in broader terms. Instead of looking at it as a particular confrontation between God and humanity, look at it as God's decision to unmake creation as it was made before and remake both the world and his relationship with humanity in different terms. And in order to understand those different terms, we'll get to that at the end of today's uh, discussion, we need to understand better what was wrong and how the deluge was supposed to correct that in some way. And we will do it by focusing on three categories at each stage of the story. We started now with God's regrets and we will start there. And we said that it reflects a certain rock bottom moment in God's relationship with men. But we will discuss also what it tells us about the relationship between people at this era and what does it tell us about their perhaps most basic relationship of all the relationship between a person and himself or herself in other words at every stage of the story we're going to ask what can we learn from this stage about god standing in front of men about men in front of men and about a person meeting themselves and already from the get-go i can say that this moment of complete crisis, of complete eclipse in the relationship between God and man is connected according to many, 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 many commentators and um, interpreters over the years with a spread of corruption in the relationship between people as well. In the sense that, sorry. <laughs> the text itself doesn't give us too much information about what it was that people did that was so terrible, right? All it says is that people are doing something bad and that uh, their thoughts are bad, but we don't know what it is that they're doing. We don't understand what it is that they're making of the world. And then start coming the interpreters and commentators and say, what people are doing that's wrong is related to sexual aspects of, of reality. It's not just rapacity that people are stealing from each other or even killing each other. There's something corrupted in the way people are relating to one another. Many of those commentators, I mean, you can't see it in the text we just read together, right? There's nothing here about marital relationships. It's not about that at all. But the commentators say that in order to understand it fully, you need to go a few verses back to the beginning of chapter six in Genesis to an episode that seems completely unrelated to anything that came before it and anything that came after it, and read that episode as the introduction that explains to us what's about to come. So let's look at it together. I am here at box two. When men began to increase on earth and daughters were born to them, the divine beings, in Hebrew it's B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, saw how beautiful the daughters of men were and took wives from amongst them that pleased them. 
the Lord said, my breath shall not abide in man forever, since he too is flesh. Let the days allowed him be 120 years. Now, just like God's decision to destroy the world and the deluge, this decision too seems kind of weird. What does it mean? Why is God responding by limiting people's tenure on earth? Also, we happen to know that this limitation didn't actually take place. We know that Korah, Avraham, all these people who lived after the deluge lived for longer than 120 years. So what does it mean that God says, oh, I'm limiting it to 120 years? And even <laughs> taking a step back, what is God even punishing them for? What does it mean that the sons of God took the daughters of men? What, God suddenly has children? What are we talking about here? Who are these sons of God? Now, many, many of our commentators from the sages of the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara onwards have tried to tackle this bizarre episode and try to understand what does it mean? Who are these sons of God and what's so wrong about what they're doing? So there's a strong strand that's um, somewhat odd for us, I think, in the modern time to think about that it's some sort of angels. This will set aside for now. Other uh, strands of interpretation focused on the on the fact that in biblical Hebrew, Elim Elohim sometimes is used not just for God but also for people of great power in society, leaders, leaders of men. And they said, okay, so it's the sons of the powerful men saw the other girls and saw that they were good. Remember how God saw that the light is good, that the sky is good, the plants are good. They're, they're they're assuming a godlike attitude. They're judging that something is good and they take these women. Now, we know already from God's response that something must be wrong about the way they're taking these women, right? There, something must be distorted about it for it to earn God's uh, punishment, whatever this punishment means. So how do you explain that? And I would like to show you two readings. One um, from Rashi, who's also quoting uh, Genesis Rabbah, and another from Genesis Rabbah that offers a slightly different um, interpretation. Let's look what Rashi says about the verse, that they were fair, that they were good. They saw that they were good. Rabbi Yudan said, it is written here, tovot, for when they were being made to appear good by being decked out to be taken beneath the marriage canopy, one of the lords would come and violate her first. In other words, um, primum noctis, is that how you call it in Latin, primum nocti? The, the right of the first night, that the girls who are about to be married, whoever has power can come and take them first, can take their virginity. Note that it doesn't mean that they're marrying them. It doesn't mean they're making them their wives. They're just using them. They're taking them in the most um, rudimentary physical sense of the word. In Genesis Rabbah, in the Bereshit Rabbah, it goes on, and I, I only found the Hebrew, I'll translate it as I read. Um, and they took women of all they chose. Those are other men's wives, meaning not just a bride, any man, any woman that person would be interested in, they took from whoever they chose, meaning also from amongst men and animals. Um, meaning that people didn't exercise any sort of restraints. There is no sort of boundaries. There is no sort of um, this is indecent or this is wrong or this woman is the bride of somebody else um, or this woman is unwilling and unconsenting or this is not even a human being. There is no boundaries. People did not um, look at the world and say, this is mine and this is yours, this is me and this is you, and I want to cling on to you and leave my father and mother and become one flesh like Adam and Eve did. No, people said, I am I and I see something I desire. And the only question, the relevant question now is not what can we do together? What can we form together? Are you interested in me as well? The only relevant question is, can I? Do I have the power? And if I happen to be a son of God in that sense, in the sense of a son of someone powerful, then the answer is, yes, I have the power. And then I will take and take and take as I want. Now, 
this is hardly a phenomenon that is unfamiliar to us, I think. I think we all are familiar with this phenomenon of the corruption that can spread between people when people start treating each other as fellow human beings and start treating them as objects of desire, objects of gratification. In fact, within the book of Genesis itself, we will see three different cases, three different stories that explore this kind of corruption. One is a story of Sdom, what happens in Sdom. One is a story of the rape of Dina. And one is a story of what the wife of Potiphar wanted to do to Joseph. I wanna look briefly at these stories, not so much because um, we're going to really sink our teeth into them and analyze them, but because I hope to show you that this corruption, this sin or this uh, licentiousness, but really it's not about passion, it's about an exercise of power in matters of passion that is unchecked. Um, is a bigger problem than just another sin from the many sins that people can exercise in their relationships with one another. And it's a bigger problem because it never stops. The second this is the principle of our relationship, the second this is the way people start relating to one another, it spreads and spreads and distorts every human relationship around them. At least this is the position that the book of Genesis slowly shows us by kind of in different stories showing us variations on the so same theme. Going? I'm sorry? Okay. okay. Let's look together at what happens in stone. And I know that we're jumping ahead and we didn't talk about this, the deluge yet. We didn't talk about how God punishes them. But first, let's understand the sin. Let's understand why it's so, so dangerous. What happens a few, uh, quite a few chapters ahead is that Lot, Abraham's nephew, lives in Sodom and he's hosting two men, angels or messengers of God. And then the following happens. I'm in box three. They had not yet lain down when the townspeople, the men of Sodom, young and old, in Hebrew it's minar it's not just young and old, it's from the youngest to the oldest, all the people to the last man, gathered about the house and they shouted to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may be intimate with them. So Lot went out to them to the entrance, shut the door behind him and said, I beg you, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you please but do not do anything to these men since they have come under the shelter of my roof. This scene just goes from bad to worse, doesn't it? It starts with this horrific scene of the townspeople wanting to rape the guests. And we can already see the corruption of the city. We know because we already saw the ch chapter earlier than that, that God is about to destroy the city, much like he earlier destroyed the entire world in the time of the Mabul, of the deluge, of the flood. And now we see why. We see how they behave to fellow human beings. But living within this condition, within these conditions, living in this world where this is a possibility, distorts Lot's relationships as well because he thinks that it's a legitimate trade to say, don't rape my guests, rape my daughters instead. Now you could say he's desperate. You could say, don't judge a person at the moment of uh, his distress. I think you can judge a person in this case, but regardless of my own opinion, the fact stands that the relationship between Lot and his daughters is one of possession. Just like the men of the city, when they see guests, don't see fellow human beings, but rather see something they can use, an object for their pleasure, for their gratification, either of passion or of power play, of just asserting their power there in that case. He sees his daughter as commodities, as something he can use to achieve a result that he desires. The poison goes deeper than just the man's attitude in the city. It's, it's inside his household. And in the end, it turns against himself. 
because the angels famously save him and his daughters, they try to save also his wife who looks back and becomes a, uh, and becomes a petrified. And then him, Lot and his daughters end up taking shelter in a cave. And the daughters turn to their father with the same kind of attitude of using another human being instead of consensually working together. They think they're the last humans on earth. They think the world is over. And the older one said to the younger, as we see in verse 31, our father is old and there is not a man on earth to concert with us in the way of all the world. Come, let us make our father drink wine and let us lie with him that we may maintain life through our father. And they do exactly that. The poison of possessiveness or of objectifying attitudes that we saw on the city scale and then on a family scale, eventually is turned against the man of the family as well. We can see a different yet similar progression in the Joseph in the Dina story. Just a reminder of what we're talking about. Jacob, whom we will discuss at length in a few weeks, comes back from his father-in-law house across the river in Transjordan. He comes back with his four wives or two wives and two concubines. We will discuss that later in a different class. He comes back with 12 children and he, no, sorry, at this point, there's still 11. And he settles down near 12 sons and one daughter, Dina. And he settles down near a city named Shechem, which inconveniently also has a prince named Shechem, son of Hamon. And this prince decides that he wants Jacob's daughter, Dina. Let's look together at box four. Shechem, son of Hamor the Hittite, chief of the country, saw her, Dina, and took her and lay with her by force. Again, this verb, ikach, just like the sons of God took whatever women they wanted, so does he take the girl. He doesn't court her. He doesn't talk to her. He takes her and he sleeps with her and he takes her by force. Being strongly drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and in love with a maiden, he spoke to the maiden tenderly. So Shechem said to his father, Hamo, get me this girl as a wife. There's a weird discrepancy here, right? The first verse tells us about how he just takes her by force and does whatever he wants with her. Then suddenly we hear that his soul, davka, tidbak, is to cleave onto. It's exactly the wording from Genesis 2, from when Adam and Eve meet for the first time, and we hear that, uh, therefore, a man will cling, cleave, idbak, in his wife, and they create one, and they become one flesh. So suddenly his soul clings to her, and he loves her, and he courts her, and he wants to marry her. And we must wonder what happened here. How come, how did he move from this rapacious kind of casual taking to love? Many commentators point out that when he sees the girl, he takes her and sleeps with her and, tort and just torments her, takes her by force. Who does he love? Who does he become attracted to? Who does he want to cling on to? Dina Batiako. And they say, as long as she was just an anonymous pretty girl in his land, he saw no reason to do anything other than take her for his pleasure. Then he realizes that she's the daughter of a rich and powerful man. And suddenly it becomes expedient to develop a relationship. Suddenly love comes into the story. Desire comes into the story. Um, speaking gently comes into the story. The heart of the girl, he spoke to the maynard tenderly in Hebrew, it's by the Bera Levanara, he spoke to her heart. Suddenly her heart is relevant. But the fact that it's so pointedly mention her name at that stage in verse number three here makes it very clear to us or at least hints very strongly that all these like pleasanter sides of his relationship with her are only another form of objectifying just like he wanted to possess her body before he knew who she is now he wants to possess the alliance she can offer him now that he does know who she is. 
Then comes a whole story where Shechem go, uh, talks to his father and his father goes to talk to Jacob and Jacob is horrified at what happened to his daughter and Jacob's sons say, no, no, no. If you want to marry our sister, you need to be um, circumcised. And they have no intention of carrying through with that. This is just a ploy for them. But then Shechem and Hamor like this idea. They like the idea of becoming circumcised and therefore being able to marry back and forth with Jacob's family. And they go and explain it to their townspeople. And I want you to pay attention to the wording of how they explain it, because the wording of how they explain it reveals their mercenary agenda. I am here at verse 21. These people are our friends. This is not actually what it says. What it says in Hebrew is shlemim emitanu. They, they're at peace with us. They, they can be wholesome with us. Let them settle in the land and move about in it for the land is large enough for them. We will take their daughters to ourselves as wives and gives our daughter to them. So far, there's a little bit of an ominous tone because note that they first say we will take their daughters and only then we will give them. But then listen what happens. But only on this condition will the men agree with us to dwell amongst us and be as one kindred. Um, sorry, that all our males become circumcised as they are circumcised. And now comes the real reveal. Now comes the, the honest bit at the end. Their cattle and substance and all their beasts will be ours. If we only agree to their terms that they will settle amongst us. The same rapaciousness that Shem, the individual, exhibited in approaching the girl, Dina, the individual, is then revealed to be part of a deeper attitude towards people of, can we absorb them? Can we take what they want from them? Can they become kindred, friends, in-laws? Well, actually, ours. Ours, 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 ours. La Nuhen, as it says here. The story, though, doesn't really leave the sons of Jacob as uh, glowing pinnacles of um, virtue. Because after the entire city circumcises themselves, on the third day when they're weak and sick and feeling ill, Shimon and Levi, brothers of Dina, come and kill all the males, everybody, and they take the rest as slaves. I'm jumping ahead to verse 29 all their wealth, all their children and their wives, all that was in the houses, they took and ca as captives and booty. A story that begins with the stealing of a woman ends with the enslaving of many other women. And the coin on both sides is a coin of might. There's no trust, there's no goodwill on both ends of this relationship of this uneven and difficult relationship between Jacob's small family and the people of Shechem, the Hittites, the, the language that they're using, the language of their relationship is one of who can use might or trickery. Um, and this makes right. Now, the Joseph story we're not going to get into, but it's a similar thing. We see a woman who is trying to seduce a slave, in this case, Joseph, and then lies about it. And we see how Joseph is thrown to prison over it. And um, once again, we see that a person is treated as a tool, as an object that can either gratify you or be tossed aside and lied about. There's no truth. There's no element of honor in the relationship. Joseph is honorable. He says, I can't sleep with you, Mrs. Uh, my employer's wife, because my employer trusts me. I can't sleep with you. But she has no honor. She's not saying, okay, fine. She's lying about him. She's telling that he tried to rape her. She's concocting a whole story to make sure that Joseph is discarded and punished and put in jail. And if it wasn't for God's intervention and the whole story that follows, and we will cover that towards the end of our course, he would have rotted in jail. He would have, he would have been left just like that. That was her design. That was her intention. And the reason I keep repeating this pattern, the reason I keep analyzing each of these stories is not just to, uh, you know, give us a greatest hits of horrors and Genesis uh, ahead of time, 
but it's to show that when we hear that the sons of God started taking the daughters of men, when we understand that power starts entering marital relationships between men and women in the pre-Deluvian Deluvian world, what we're seeing is not just one isolated sin, one isolated vice amongst many. What we're seeing is a shift that unmakes, in a sense, God's intention in the creation of man. Because if God created man to be in his image, what we see when we see people um, treating each other like objects in this way, like possessions, like things to take in this way, is we see men making the world in their image. What do I want? What do I care for? What are my desires? I am going to fight and take and scheme and um, uh, lie to make the world in my image, my personal, vicious, desirous image. And this is the world that God wants to remove. This is the world that God wants to unmake. The whole project of making people who are good in their heart because they're made under after God's image fails because instead of living up to that potential, men use all the powers that God invested in them, all the talents to take what they want. So we see why it's a crisis for God and man, and it's a crisis in the relationships between humans. But the truth is that this crisis goes all the way to the relationship between man and himself, between any person and their own uh, inner lives. And it does so because, and this is not from the text, this is just us um, looking at the world around us and learning from it. It does so because when people start treating each other as objects, when people start seeing each other not as fellow humans or as Martin Buber said it, I am thou. If I don't see you as an thou, but rather as a it, something for me to use in whatever way I want it or can have the power to do, or as an obstacle in the way to my desires that needs to be removed, they also distort their own perception of reality. They also shortchange themselves from countless opportunities of growth. We talked about it already in the first uh, class and discourse about how the story of the first encounter between Adam and the woman who will later become Chava shows us how both of them are changed into the relationship. The relationship is a growth opportunity. Adam, who was named after his origins, becomes Ish. He's naming the white, the woman after him, but himself after the woman as well. And we hear about how every man and woman in history can leave their mother and father and cling unto his wife, sorry, the man, and cling unto his wife and become one flesh and change, outgrow something. But if the other person is an object to take, there's nothing about this encounter that demands changing from you. Because if I just take and take and take, I am constantly using my own desires as that which charts my course. I am not allowing myself to meet the desires of another person and try and change myself to meet them and make something new that works for both of us. In other words, I'm locking myself into whatever horizons I can imagine and I'm not allowing other opportunities. I'm not allowing, sorry, I'm not allowing other people to carry me past these horizons and do something else. There's this wonderful book um, called um, The Basics, The Seven Plots, The Seven Basic Plots. It has nothing to do on the face of it with the Hebrew Bible, even though it does mention it in some places. It's a book about storytelling and about how, according to Christopher Booker, the author of this book, if you look at stories from throughout history and throughout geographical, the geographical expanse of the entire uh, human world, there's certain plot lines that repeat themselves over and over and over again. And by delving into these plot lines, uh, using some psychoanalytic tools, some uh, uh, anthropological tools, he's showing how there's certain truth that all stories in the world teach us. And he shows how tragedy, tragic stories, 
always show us the process of someone who pursues some selfish goal and this pursuit blinds them and isolates them from other people. It removes them to their own very blinkered uh, plane of reality because they're so focused, they have tunnel vision. They, don't, they no longer see the damages they cause. They no longer see the desires of the people around them. They just ignore it. Whereas stories of happy ending often, not always, but often show us the opposite. They show how someone overcomes this distorting power, this uh, distorting aspect of egotism. I will read here in box five. I'm, I recommend reading the entire, both quotes, but I will focus here on the second quote. What stories show us is how it is at the very nature of egotism, that it can only see the world in a subjective, restricted fashion. Wherever it holds sway, it casts around it a shadow, which also tends to obscure the vision of everyone who is in that shadow. In other words, when one person is being egotistic, it distorts also the people around them. When the people of Sodom see only what they want, it distorts Lot. And when it distorts Lot, it distorts his daughters. Equally, we have seen how it is an inseparable part of coming to the light, by which he means the kind of realization that allows people to change, outgrow egotism and gain a happy ending, that this should bring a clear vision. Seeing whole does not mean that they see and know everything. What it does mean is that they can see everyone and everything objectively for what they really are. They have been liberated from the distortion of echo consciousness onto a different level, which give them a clear understanding. And what we see um, through the negative examples in Genesis is that as long as people are not doing that, as long as people are allowing egocentrism to really shape their relationship, even with one person, it spreads. That becomes the basis of society. But it starts from a distortion of the self. In other words, the generation of the deluge not only lost God's favor, not only corrupted their relationships between themselves with other people, they also lost the ability to see one another, to see reality objectively, because they were each preoccupied with what they desire and how they can get it, and that was that. And into this world, God introduces the punishment. It's not even a punishment, really. It's a, a way to restart the world. And the punishment is a deluge. And it's a very fitting punishment um, to this particular evil, the evil of being, of treating other people as objects and taking whoever you can. Let's look at the punishment together and see why, why it's so fitting. It's fitting because people blurred the boundaries between themselves. They blur the boundaries between what's good and what's bad, what's permissible and not permissible, what I want and what you want, mine and yours. In the name of taking whatever they want, they dismissed all those boundaries that make life possible in society as a de uh, in a decent way. And what God does is he takes away all the boundaries that makes life physically possible in the world. In the creation of the world, we saw that God first created darkness and light, sky and earth, water, areas of water and areas of dry land. And that was the setting the scene. That was what allowed life to then come onto the scene with the creation of plants and uh, animals and humans. And it's exactly these distinctions that God removes when he allows the flood to change the world. Let's look together. I am at box number six, Genesis seven. The flood continued 40 days on the earth and the waters increased and raised the ark so that it rose above the earth. The waters swelled and increased greatly upon the earth and the ark drifted upon the waters. There's no longer a distinction between um, earth and land. There's no dry land anymore. When the waters had swelled much more upon the earth, um, all the highest mountains everywhere under the sky were covered. Um, before that, it describes how there's also rain. You can't quite tell where the water is coming from. There's water from above, there's water from below. There's no distinction like that. 15 cubits higher did the water swell and the mountains were covered. And then when the scene that allows life to exist is removed, life dies as well. And all flesh that steered on each earth perished. 
birds, cattle, beasts, and all the things that swarmed upon the earth and all mankind. All in whose nostrils was the merest breath of life, all that was on dry land died. All existence on earth was blotted out, men, cattle, creeping things, and birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and dove with him in the ark. This comment, only Noah was left, parallels the comment above when God regrets everybody, but likes Noah. So here God removes everybody, but saves Noah. And he does it by putting Noah, by inviting Noah to enter into an ark. That too, even though it's an instrument of saving Noah in this particular story, can be seen as an appropriate response to what men did to themselves when they distorted their relationships. Because we said that distorting the basis of our relationship with other people distorts also our sense of self, what we see, our possibilities of growth. And it's as if God says, okay, fine. You keep limiting yourself. First, you ignore the boundaries. So I'll remove the boundaries, no problem. You remove the boundaries in the moral world, I'll remove the boundaries in the physical world. Let's see how you survive, how well you can do, make, do for yourself. But then God says another thing. God says, you keep blinkering yourself. You keep limiting your ability to see the world by focusing on your own desires and taking and taking and taking and objectifying everything around you to an arena of desire. Fine, so what's left of humanity? What's left of the world? I'm going to limit it too. You narrowed your field of, of looking. You narrowed your own internal uh, possibilities of growth. I am going to narrow humanity to the barest, barest, merest minimum, to a confined space, both genetically and physically. And we will see. First, be there. Then from there, we will see how you come out and how you change and whether we can reestablish a world. And of course, they do. The deluge stops. Noah sends out first the uh, raven, then three times the dove until he establishes that there is a, a dry land. And even then he goes on waiting. He waits until God calls out and says, come out. And in that moment, when finally humanity is given an opportunity to come out along with the animals, it's safe, from the confines and start filling the world again, a new word makes it onto the scene, a word that does not appear anywhere in Genesis until that point. And that is the word family, mishpacha. God says, I am in box seven, come out of the ark together with your wife, your sons, and your son's wives. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds, animals, and everything that creeps on earth. And let them swarm on the earth and be fertile and increase on earth. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, and his son's wives. Every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that stirs on earth came out of the ark, le mishpachotehem, by families, family by family. Out of the ark, which limited the genetic pool and limited living creatures to a small confined space, come these little portable arcs, families. We no longer talk about relationships in an abstract sense of people take women somewhere on earth. We no longer talk about people giving birth to others without defining their relationship in some way. Now we're talking about a unit and this unit as a name. And the rest of the story of humanity from this point on is going, at least from the perspective of the Tanakh, to be based on this unit. This is the unit that we will follow from next week with the rise of Avraham and his children and moving forward. And even when we're going to watch this unit, the family unit expand to be a people, a nation, its first name is going to be the sons of Israel. The nation is going to be built on the family unit and expand from there. Why? Why is the word appearing here? The Midrash, and Midrash on Chumah, we don't have time to read it, but you have it in your source sheet if you want to read it later, makes the following suggestion. It says that the text pointedly calls the animals being families as well, right? Not just the humans. 
And it suggests that it's another hint that the corruption that led to the God's decision to unmake reality had to do with sexual impurity. And that the sexual um, practices of just taking whoever and whatever you want weren't limited to humanity. Animals as well had um, sexual relations interspecies and there was a lot of just license in the world. And the animals coming out of the Teva, just like the people coming out of the Ark of the Teva, are those who learned and were willing to refrain, to limit themselves to their kind, to limit themselves to their lawful family, to remain separate in these little units instead of taking whatever they want from all around. Sivan Rav Mehir is a great celebrity here in Israel, a wonderful um, journalist and a wonderful teacher of Torah. In her book, that might have been translated into English, I don't know. It's called the uh, Status Ayudi, the Jewish status. And it co collates a lot of her partially related Facebook statuses. Wrote the following, my translation, so please forget it. After humanity was wiped out in the deluge due to moral corruption and fidelity and the ability to commit to any value, inability to commit to any values, it is suddenly written by families, a family. That is what was created after the great storm. But instead of focusing on the animals here, she says that the rise of family is something that can only happen after we learn the lessons of the deluge. In her words, speaking in the context of living within a family unit, I once heard a wise man make the following statement, limiting my desires to make room for other people's desires. That is the only way to be built up, to grow up. Only after we were forced to the ark. Only after we saw what the consequences of not limiting ourselves, of taking whatever we want and not taking other people's desires under consideration, can we be ready to truly practice the kind of self-limitation that allows a family to be formed? A family cannot exist if one person takes, 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 takes what they want. A family can exist when I make room for you and you make room for me and the third party makes room as well. And for that to happen, people apparently, sadly, tragically, had to undergo uh, enormous collective tra um, trauma to really set them straight. Of course, the rise of the word family doesn't stand alone. The rise of the word family here is part of a re-establishment of the relationship between God and humanity and the world on different terms. And if you recall, this is how we started. We said that we hit rock bottom and now God is recreating the world, but on different terms. And by the way, the recreation of the world after the deluge echoes its cre first creation in chapter one. God makes a separation again between day and night. During the days and nights of the deluge, there was only darkness. Now suddenly there's, again, we can talk about morning and evening. God makes a separation between the sky and the earth. The rain stops. We can see the sky and we can see the earth and we can see they're separate. God makes a separation between places of water and places of dry land by allowing the water to recede, recede, recede until first the tops of the mountains and then even below them is seen again. God allows plants to be seen, that dove comes back with the bough of the olive tree. And then animals and humanity step onto the stage once more. But the terms under which they step onto the stage are different. And different thinkers, different teachers understand these terms in different ways and put the emphasis in different places. And how I want to finish today's class, or at least finish this part of it, is by reading the part that tells us what God changes about the world after the deluge, and then showing how we can read it in different ways. One that focuses on God's relationship with humanity, one that focuses on the relationships between people, and one that focuses on our relationship with ourselves. So let's look at it together. I am going ahead to, um, sorry, to um, here. Um, I'm in box number eight, but I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to the last 
um, source. I'm gonna make it a little bigger for you. Here. After they come out, we hear, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fertile and increase and fill the earth. The fear and the dread of you shall be upon all the beasts of the earth and upon all the birds of the sky, everything with which the earth is astir, and upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. Every creature that lives shall be yours to eat. This is new. Before that, they were only allowed to eat plants. As with the green grasses, I give you all these. You must not, however, eat flesh with its life blood in it. And for your own life blood, I will require a reckoning. I will require it of every beast of men too. Will I require a reckoning for human life of every man for that of his fellow men? In other words, be wary of murdering each other. Whoever sheds the blood of men, by men shall his blood be shed. For in his image did God make men. Be fertile then and increase, abound on the earth and increase on it. And after that, God also decides that there's never going to be a flood again. No matter what happens, even if humanity corrupts itself once more, there's never going to be a flood. So what do all these changes mean? What does it mean that now they're allowed to eat meat? Why are they allowed to eat meat? What does it mean that God makes such a point about murder? about how murder is not allowed because God, man is created in the image of God. Why is that suddenly the big deal, the big emphasis? What does it mean that God says, oh, I'm never going to destroy the earth again? Why does God make this uh, decision suddenly? And here is where different interpretations really diverge. One interpretation um, that is beautifully summed up, it's, it's drawn from many sources, but it's beautifully summed up by Rabbi Jonathan Grossman from Gush Etzion. He's also the head, I think, of biblical studies and Bar Ilan University here in, in Israel. Um, puts the emphasis on the fact that the word family creates this weird affinity between men and animals. Remember how when men and animals came out, they all came out in families? So Rabbi Grossman says that also in these instructions that God gives us, and there's a weird affinity between animals and men. In the previous story of creation, the original story of creation, there was a very clear distinction between animals and humanity. First animals were created. You can see it here if you wanna read later. And then God created men in his image. And the order that God gave them, other than to be fruitful and multiply, was to rule over the animals. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on earth. Here, after the deluge, God doesn't say rule. God says, everyone will fear you. The animals will fear you. Your fear will act upon them. He doesn't say um, you have my authority to be their rulers. If anything, it emphasizes that men and animals are somehow together now. They come out of the, of the ark together. They're all in families. They're all given the earth. They're all allowed to eat meat now. So Rabbi Grossman concludes from all of that, that what we're watching here is a diminishing in the status of men. But before the deluge, man was the king, the benevolent king that God appointed to rule and take care of the animals. Men proved that they can't do that, that they place their interests first, that they become tyrants, if we want to use the language of politics, instead of benevolent rulers. And because of that, God now treats them as a more developed, higher form of animal life but not one that can be expected not to eat meat or rule or be responsible for the world. And therefore not one whose actions should cause devastation on a global scale. If humanity does sins, why should the animals suffer? Humanity is no longer responsible for them. Humanity no longer represents them. Humanity is demoted. And Rabbi Grossman says that this is important because it explains why Abraham is needed. Abraham is going to rise at the end of this story, and we will follow Abraham next week. 
And it's important to understand why God creates a covenant with one individual when we realize that God gave up on the idea of having a covenant with humanity at large. Before that God entrusted humanity with controlling everybody, everything in the world, humanity betrayed this trust. That says, fine, never mind. Now I will have national and private covenants with, just like I saved Noah, the individual, I'm going to have a covenant with an individual and then with a particular people. I'm no longer expecting humanity at large as such to be responsible for the rest of the world. So this is one reading. And this is a reading that really focuses on the relationship between God and man. Rabbi Sachs, um, whose your site was just uh, earlier today, and I think maybe for you it still is. I'm, I'm a little confused about the date line, to be honest. Um, had another reading, a reading that really focuses on something else, that focuses on the relationship between people. And it focuses also on the shift in the language. Again, if we compare this story of recreation, coming out of the ark as recreation of the world, to the creation of the world, the emphasis of each creation is different. Because in the first story of creation in Genesis, the emphasis lay on the word good. The leitmotiv, the word that repeats itself is good. God sees that this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. Now, after God already saw that men are bad in their heart and what they think about is bad and what they plan for is bad, this is no longer the word. The word that repeats itself is brit, covenant. And not only does the word change, but also the way the text references God's image as the blueprint of humanity changes. In the first story of creation, we're told that God creates humanity in his image. It's a gift. It's something that's within us. And that's it. And we're supposed to use it for the good. And the second one, God doesn't tell us, oh, you have are created in the image of man. He tells us, don't kill other people because they are created in the image of God. Not you, they. By extension, you as well. But the focus, your focus, humanity, can no longer be on how you, I am great. I am made in the image of God. Because we saw what happens when you start thinking like that. What do you do? You start taking whatever you want because you, you take it as license. You take it as, I am so powerful. I am so great. I can do whatever I want. The goodness of your heart, the goodness that was the focus of chapter one in Genesis can no longer be the basis of human behavior. I can't, I, God, can't trust you to retain this baseline. So instead, I'm going to ask you to focus on creating covenantal relationships between yourselves. And this will be an expression of your covenant with me. Because what those covenantal relationships rely on is on your recognition of my image, not in me and not in yourself, but in each other. I'm no longer relying on the goodness of your heart. I am relying on stand of, on your ability to make room for the other, to tie it back to what we were discussing before. And this is the post diluvian world. This is why the world family becomes possible in this world. I wanna offer one more reading um, that focuses really on less our relationship with God and less our relationship with uh, each other and more our relationship with ourselves. But um, I will take some of the questions first. Um, I apologize as always that I can't take all of them. Um, Asher Stein writes, following Rabbi Litbag's uh, breakdown of creation, we see the word kitov after each stage of creation except the stage of creation of men. The words tov me'at, me'od, very good, seem to apply to the sum total of all that was created. This is a good point, and indeed, um, there are commentators who comment about that, that um, man can't be good in of itself, because man is created with free choice. This is what the image of God means. We talked last week about the free choice that God emphasizes in his speech to kind. You can choose how you respond to the world. You can choose who you are, and um, therefore, you can't talk about God as tov or bad, good or bad, tov or ra. Um, it's up to humanity to prove itself, and they disprove themselves in a sense. Um, uh, Asher Stein also asked, what about Paro taking Sarah and Avimelech taking Sarah and then Kanapoyin taking Yifra? 
These are excellent uh, examples of a powerful man taking a woman. The reasons I focused on other examples was that I wanted to show the spread, the way that rapacious objectifying attitude never stays limited to one incident, it becomes something that spreads. You could say that if you go beyond the confines of the book of Genesis, which is kind of our course material, um, the way Paro behaves with Sarah is very much a foreshadowing of a deeper attitude to people that will be exhibited in the enslavement of the Jewish people. I definitely uh, would agree with that. Um, just a moment. Uh, Norm Finkelberg points out that when we see that this sin is so um, horrible, the sin of taking other people's wives and that it's so um, foundational that it brings about the deluge, it puts David's sin of taking Bathsheba and killing over her husband in a more serious perspective. And I tend to agree with you that when we realize that this was the original sin that brought about the destruction of the world in a sense, if you forgive the Christian-like terminology here, um, we can see why it's such a, we can see that the entire Hebrew Bible is making a stand against it in many ways. By the way, in many places in the Midrash, about all of Genesis, it keeps highlighting one idea, which is that the people of the world and the generations of our forefathers were very careful in matters of taking other people's wives or of licentiousness in general, because they had that memory, that trauma of the deluge in their minds. They, they didn't want to engage with that. And whenever they did, there was some anxiety involved. We will see a little bit of that in Jacob's story. Um, moment. Um, Gershon Hepner points out that the Hebrew word for Mary, ki ikach ish, means when a man takes. And this is true. This is important. I didn't make it. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, I kept saying taking as a derogatory term, but it's also just the normal term for marriage in Hebrew, it's lakachatisha, you take a woman. I would argue that the context here adds the negative undertones and that in Hebrew we say lakachatisha, but we also say lekadesh isha, to make um, separate, to make holy, to, to make our own. And it's, um, and there's, it's important that the terminology is important, especially because the, I would agree that just saying lakachatisha, taking a woman, doesn't necessarily mean something negative in the Torah. But if you pay attention to the terminology around it, a lot of times it does. Meaning, you need to look at the context. You need to look at what other verbs are there or pointedly not there in the story. Okay, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I will um, finalize for now, I apologize that I can't look at all of that, but I do wanna have time to offer you that one more reading. And it's not a reading that contradicts the others. It's not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that instead, I'm just saying we focus on three aspects of relationship with God, with, between humans and with ourselves. And we talked about how egocentrism and objectifying others is also limiting our own growth opportunities. And in that regard, I wanted to point out that people's relationships with themselves people understanding of themselves after the deluge is different. Because if we treat it as a new creation story, it's a creation story where humanity is aware of its own creation. Meaning, when God takes some earth and shapes a person and creates them into Adam, presumably Adam has no consciousness of it. Suddenly he just comes into being. When God puts Adam to sleep and takes one of his ribs and creates Eve, Eve is not aware of it. Even Adam is not fully aware of it because he's asleep. He just becomes. There's Now there's humanity. Noah and his family have to put themselves in the ark, in the new womb of humanity. They have to live in that womb with the narrowness that comes with it with a feeling of confinement, with a worry about the future. They have to experience pregnancy from the baby's perspective. And they have to go out and dare to create a new world just as a baby has to go out 
and there to um, <laughs> engage with reality. And in this process, God is no longer just a shaper, a, a master um, creator. God is almost a parent because he chose Noah out of love. He likes Noah. He personally chooses him. So we, as a Noah and his family, are experiencing this entire devastating global trauma as an experience of love and care and the stress followed by relief. And when we walk into the world with all of these experiences shaping our consciousness, I believe that it makes us in a different for intimate, sorry, ready for intimacy in the way that perhaps Adam and Eve were not. Because we no longer have to just intellectually make room for other people. We know what it is to be confined. We know what it is to suffer and be reborn. We know what it is to be chosen and loved by God. We have all these experiences already sunk into our DNA, into our experience of reality. And coming out from that, we have within us what it takes to create a relationship with ourselves, with other people, and as we will discuss next week in the class about the first covenantal family uh, with God. So on that note, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I took longer and um, I'm wishing you a wonderful rest of the day and rest of the week. Passing thank the you mic very much. You. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, next up on the Torn Motion Zoom at, uh, channel, uh, tomorrow be Ivrit at 1.15 Eastern Time on Rev Carmel, Meyot Kolel Eretz Chamda, Hal HaMalchut Shel David HaMelech, HaMeyaseda Rishona, HaMalchut HaRishona, Vashlachot Shel Ad Hayom, as Kulam Muzmanim Lavoze Vachad Vareva, Machar Betzorayim, Po be Eastern Time. And then tomorrow night, um, Dr. Sokolo continues part two in his fascinating series, How Tanakh Evolved, How Tanakh Was Put Together. Then Thursday, Shuli Mishkin is back after from her, her son got married yesterday. To be back, please, God, on Thursday, 12 noon, 12 noon. And Rifki Freundlicht is giving the Parsha Shear 8.30 from, from Montreal, 8.30 uh, p.m. Thursday night. And then my, my Shear on the Close Look at the Sitter, 9.30 Friday morning. So uh, we look forward to learning with you uh, during the week. And like always, uh, please uh, invite a friend. Please give us your feedback, positive, negative. Uh, and no, what week is next week's class? I will confirm. I forgot to ask her. That was my mistake. Thank you. Right. Because next week, as we know, in Israel, there'll be an hour. It will only be a six hour time difference between the East Coast and Israel. I forgot to ask Rachel. I will. Um, I'll I'll let you know. Okay. Really, it de really depends if she could make her schedule, whatever. We'll we'll get back to you. Okay. Have a wonderful day, everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.